So most of the women you interviewed identified as anarchist communists and believed in the central role of worker self-organization to affect the societal change that could potentially abolish capitalism. Did any of your interviewees also demonstrate an understanding of the tragic ecological consequences of capitalism in particular and productivism in general, or were they relatively ecologically unaware, like many people of their generation? Well, let's just say these people were active from the 1920s to the 1950s. I don't yeah. believe that many of us in those days, I mean, I was would have been 10, um, <clears throat> were aware of the destruction that going, was going on around us. There were other issues. I mean, there was World War II. There was the rise of uh, Russia, and they fought against a lot about the Marxist communists. So yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> they had different fish to fry, different issues. Sure. Concerned. That's a good that's a good way of putting it. In your interview with James Anderson, which I'll also link to uh, beneath this video, you explained that the anarchist women you interviewed did the best they could to rebel against traditional gender roles, but were, of course, limited by the times in which they lived. Um, what are the most striking examples of gender nonconformity amongst these women that you remember? You know, our definitions of sex and gender have definitely changed. Yeah. So I would say they were opposed to the sex roles that they were assigned in those days, and they were opposed to the sexual mores of their time. Would we construct it nowadays as gender? No. They were self-defined women looking, yeah. behaving as women. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk more about the fact that um, they didn't conform to the roles that were expected of them as housewives and mothers. Um, they were all workers, workers in mostly the garment industry. A couple of them were journalists. Um, many of them had children, but chose to raise them either communally or in non-monogamous marriages, um, non-traditional marriages. Um, Emma Goldman, who I didn't interview, she was dead by the time I got around to it, but she'd had a relationship with a woman during the course of her life. So I would say that these women were quite non-conforming in terms <laughs> of the expectations of what they were supposed to be as women in those days, which okay. is what drew me to them because they were remarkably colorful, flamboyant, uh, abrasive. Um, they were non-conventional. They were to the left of the left. You have to understand sure. that anarchists are lefter than thou. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's what I loved about them. They were just sure. broads. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you mentioned in the commoner article that the women prefigured uh, second wave feminism in their assertion of the personal as political. But I wonder, did some of them even prefigure so-called third wave feminism? Although I understand that this is a uh, ambiguous and contested term um, with a possible understanding in particular of intersectionality and how different oppressions um, intersect in different ways based on ethnicity, gender, class, and so on. They were very aware without using those terms. Right. You know, that's yeah. our construction. But all of these women worked in multi-ethnic, multi-racial communities. They were, many of them were seamstresses. And those industries were integrated. And Rose Basota, who I wrote my biography about, organized in Puerto Rico. She organized Mexican workers in LA, um, you know, organized uh people that we would say now people of color, they were all involved in these trades. And so they became sisterhoods. And, um, you know, they didn't, 
there was not an equality in terms of moving into the hierarchy of the unions, but certainly on the lines at the seamstress tables, at the union tables, there was integration. Um, they were all part of the fight for yeah. better working conditions, and they worked together on that. Right, right. Um, in the commoner article, you also relate how some of the women practiced throughout their lives, and you've, you've already mentioned this, what we would now call ethical non-monogamy or polyamory or free love, even though some of them were married, um, it seems to me that the convention, I might be wrong about this, but it seems that the conventional telling of American history is that free love really began with the hippie communes of the 60s and 70s. Do you think that, that this is true, that, that history has been represented like this? And if so, do you think this distortion of history could be symptomatic of the relative relegation or abnegation by historians of the anarchist contribu contribution to important historical trends? Um, great yeah. question, to be honest with you. You know, in their day, they called it sexual varietism. Now it's polyamory okay. or okay. monogamy. It's all got yeah. different terms. It definitely predates the 60s, you know. Yeah. Many of us, most of us, are ahistorical. We don't know what preceded us. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just called different things yeah, at different right. periods of time. So these women, um, many of them had what you call non-monogamous relationships. Mm -hmm. um, wives would have affairs with fellow anarchists. Men would have affairs with other women who were anarchists or not. Um, it was part of the freedom, the sense that no one human being should dominate another human being. That's anarchist ideology, that all people, all human beings are equal and that nobody should be determining how another human being should be acting. And yes, there are norms or values that people will adhere to, you know, in terms of taking care of children, et cetera, but they believed in the freedom of their relationships. And, and even if it was hard, they would do it because it was part of the political ideology. That's why I call, why I call the article the politics of sexuality. Because, right. you know, we, we used to say the personal is political. Well, mm. this is not as personal as you get. Yeah. And, um, you know, their sex lives were personal but they were political acts of nonconformity and of stretching the boundaries of the definitions of what relationships are supposed to be like. Wow. Um, yeah. So yes, we're ahistorical, and um, you know, I I think anarchist history is obscured historically. Mm. You know, there are those of us who've written it. Paul Average's work is fabulous. Uh, A V R I C H. Um, you know, okay. I've read everything he ever wrote, and he's brilliant. He's passed away. Um, but if we keep continuing with anarchist ideology, and we just have a bad rap, you know? I yeah. mean, it, anarchism is seen as chaos. And those mm. of us who understand yeah. anarchist ideology understand that it means decentralization, non-hierarchical forms collective decision-making, the ability of leadership to be rotated. That's at the more macro level, but also in terms of personal relationships. Yeah. That people choose how they're going to live and they <laughs> negotiate it and then they live it out, even with whatever consequences come. And there were consequences. Yeah. Sure, well. sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um let me just scroll down. So in the article, you also wrote about the rebellious anarchist Yom, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Yom, Yom Kippur. Kippur. Yom, Yom Kippur. Kippur balls that mm -hmm. some of the women organized where unkosher ham sandwiches were eaten. From your interviews with the women, can you further elaborate on how anarchist and Jewish identities were combined? Well, you know, within 
the Jewish culture. There is a real deep expectation of the education, of taking right. care of the other, of being responsible for the stranger and doing good in the world. Those are anarchist values. And so it was easy for many of these women to synthesize their Jewish values with their anarchist mm -hmm. values. They cared for each other. Sometimes they didn't get along, but they cared for each other. They had a sense of doing, repairing the harm of the world that they were dedicated mm. to. They believed in embracing the stranger, kindness towards strangers, you know, to do, doing good deeds in the world. That's all Jewish and that's anarchist. And so there's that that is deeply informed in their culture, value system and ways of being. And then there was the superficial. They still ate Jewish foods, they still, <clears throat> spoke Yiddish, because most of them were from Eastern Europe. Even one of the women who was not Jewish, but married a Jewish guy, she imbued herself in Jewish culture, Eastern European Jewish culture, not from Spain, not from the Middle East. So very Eastern European. And so there was really a sense um, that although they were atheists yeah they were not they were not anti-jewish sure they were anti-religion and there's a difference and so yeah. I, I visited them i would eat traditional jewish foods at their home okay. i spoke yiddish with a couple of them because that's what they spoke when they came out of europe so it was a, an easily synthesized sense of the culture and the values with anarchism and being Jewish.